Um, I wanted to thank you all for attending the Elderworks Virtual Senior Fair. For those of you that have been on all day, we're super grateful for your support, for all of our gold sponsors, our silver sponsors, our platinum sponsors. Uh, we're just, you know, super, super uh, humbled by all of your support. Elderworks is a not-for-profit uh, company that provides uh, complimentary resources for seniors and their family to help with senior housing placement, home care placement, all sorts of wonderful resources that we provide to the general public. And you can visit us at elderworks.org uh, to look at our Elderworks directory and the many, many partners and the many, many businesses that we work with. So we are uh, extremely grateful for your presence and all the referrals that you've given us and any way that we can help you. We are all here, all of the senior care consultants. My name is Barbara Rosenberg and I am super honored to be uh, here to introduce um, my friend that um, I was blessed to meet at one of our partner communities um, uh, some years ago. Yes. Uh, and, uh, Loretta Warburbani is going to be presenting on uh, advocating for a loved one. And to tell you a bit about her, she was born with a love of life and a positive spirit. The three most important things in her life have always been her family, friends, and her faith. She loves adventures, traveling, learning something new every day, and inspiring others. Throughout her life, Loretta has chronicled family events through journals, photos, and videos seeking to capture every moment. After her beloved mother, Doris, was diagnosed with dementia in 2006, <laughs> documenting the details of doctor visits and recording people, places, and things as a substitute for her mom's lost memory. The combination of written documentation and her incredible memory became Loretta's first published work in 2013, entitled Being My Mom's Mom. And on that note, I will say that her mother is still alive and well, and we get to follow each other on Facebook and get to see all the tries and tribulations. So I'm happy that you're here presenting to us and for us. And um, without that, um, enjoy. All right. Thank you so much, Barb. That was fabulous. You know, the only problem with uh, <laughs> introductions is that then you. So that's always uh, that's always the key thing for me. You know, make sure you live up to um, all the things that people say about you. So first, with that slide up. I want to thank Elderworks, of course, for having me and for all of the sponsors of today's fabulous event. I've been on since noon and this has been phenomenal. I took a lot of notes and everything. So I am just thrilled to be here. And as Barb said, we are going to talk about this afternoon advocating for our loved ones. So when I was first asked to do this, I thought I hadn't done, um, in, I've talked about advocating a lot but not in an entire program. So I was so excited um, about this and my biggest problem was cutting stuff out. So let's talk about what we're gonna do in our um, 45 minutes this afternoon. So uh, I'm a definition person. So first I'll tell you a little bit about, you know, the definition of an advocate and what they actually do. Um, there's a huge uh, national advocacy over a lot of different um, diseases and issues. So we'll talk about what that looks like in terms of caregiving. And, but we're going to spend most of this presentation looking at best practices. Um, I've been doing lots of uh, things for, you know, my mom and for friends as well, other family members to, you know, ensure that their rights are protected at all times. So I'm going to share with you the things that uh, have been best practices for us and some things to avoid <laughs> that I also did. So hopefully you'll find this uh, useful and worthwhile as well. Feel free to take you know, photos of the uh, slides if you can't wait till the recording comes out. So whatever it is that makes you happy during this time, just go ahead and uh, do that to make sure you get all the information that you absolutely need. So as promised, here is the definition. What is an advocate? Basically, it just comes down to someone. It doesn't have to be uh, a loved one, I mean, as you see in the slide there, it can be a family member, a friend, just, you know, it could be a paid caregiver or professional, you know, health person, but they all have one thing in common, and that is being the spokesperson, if you will, for someone who needs it. So I love, you know, the definition of ad advocacy. It is speaking up in support of an idea or an action, and in our case, um, an actual person. So an advocate's role, if you are serving in that, is to protect uh, a person and their rights and to ensure that their rights are maintained at all times. This is everybody's favorite, one of everybody's favorite pictures of us 
and uh, she looks like she's still in charge, but that's because she is. And so <laughs> this was earlier uh, this year before the lockdown. So you hear me talk a lot about um, that. And you'll get to know my family pretty well as we go through this uh, presentation. Now, first and foremost, why are advocates needed in the first place? Well, simple. There are times, and in my mother's case, where they cannot speak up for themselves. They cannot express you know, their values, their wishes uh, in any way, shape or form. And you know, they need, absolutely need someone to do that for them. And one of the things that you know, makes advocacy so fulfilling is knowing that you are representing the wishes of someone else. And uh, the article that you're looking at was really about you know, how this is. As Barbara mentioned, uh, this is a labor of love when we do it. And when you're taking on an advocacy role, you absolutely are taking on that labor of love. So a lot of need out there for advocates too. Not everybody has a family member to go with them. And so somebody needs to uh, take that on. One of the questions I do get quite a bit especially when there are lots of people in a family and they're trying to determine who's really going to be the advocate for their loved one, especially if everybody lives in different places. So here are the skills that a lot of different uh, organizations, you know, tout for m allowing you to be the best advocate you can be. So these are some of the best skills. Notice the first item says assertiveness as opposed to aggressiveness. Because, you know, when we're too aggressive, you know, it's important to make points for the person we're advocating for, but not so that it gets us lots of enemies. <laughs> and that's usually not a great thing, uh, as our, our loved one told us, you know, do unto others. So sometimes even when situations are bad, we're going to talk about when things go wrong in this presentation and how to still be an advocate in those situations. It does take assertiveness, but when we switch to uh, aggressiveness, or on the other hand, if we're too passive and we're not really speaking up for something we know that individual would want, then that assertiveness is a skill we really wanna try to bring forth. You need to certainly be comfortable, very comfortable talking with doctors, social workers, healthcare providers, all of these folks who are gonna have a say in this person that you're advocating for. Just like the doctor that we heard just before me talking about Parkinson's, you know, he had a lot of, you know, uh, good definitions and different kinds of um, things that happen with Parkinson's disease. And you have to be, he sat down and said, you know, what questions do you have? He seems very willing to work with you, but you have to be able to ask the questions as well. I would put an asterisk by the third item, which says, time commitment. You know, I see a lot of people who said, oh, I, I thought this advocacy thing, you know, I, I thought I could do it, but it just takes too much time. Please consider that when you volunteer to become an advocate for somebody that really depending on you and the time commitment, you know, um, if you know the, their health status, are they pretty, you know, stable? At the moment, they didn't have to go back and forth to a lot of doctor visits. My mother was stable, incredibly stable for about eight years or so. And so very little time was involved going to doctors or social workers or anything like that. So find out, if you wanna know exact things on time commitment, get a good sense of what the person's current status is. And then you'll know how much, at least you have an idea, you never really know, but at least you can have an idea of what you might be getting yourself into. What about organizational skills? You might have to keep up with appointments, with medicine, you know, all kinds of things that are going to revolve around this person's care. So hopefully you have some really good organizational skills or, as I love to say, there's an app for that. If you go to, you know, uh, your app store and go and type in uh, whatever uh, situation that you're, the person you're advocating for has. So like the gentleman, the doctor did talk before us, you know, you could see if there was any apps to help with Parkinson's. I know that there are. And in my case for dementia, yes, indeed. There are lots of apps to help with uh, getting the family organized. You know, you're going to take mom to the doctor tomorrow or, you know, the, to the barber or to the doctor or whatever. So everybody has a different and a chore that they have to do. So the more organizational skills you have, the better advocate you will be. 
And then uh, probably most important on this slide is understanding the privacy issue. You cannot, when you become an advocate, you know, go to, when we used to go to restaurants, go to the restaurant with your best friend, talk about, oh, you won't believe what happened with Beth today. You cannot discuss Beth with other people unless it's, you know, best family and you have permission to, you know, talk to them. Privacy is a huge issue when it comes to, you know, someone else's care. So we have to be really, really careful about what we share. So these are the skills that will make you incredibly successful. And even if you only have one or two of these, you can always work on the others. So don't be afraid to be an advocate. You know, well, I'm kind of quiet. You can learn assertiveness, especially if it's somebody in your family. Trust me on that. Although I've never been a passive person. I'm sure you can tell that <laughs> in this few minutes uh, already. Now, it sounds like a good thing. You'd love to have one. How do you get one? Take a look. And, and the first two items are connected in most states. I live in the state of Maryland. And um, one of the first things I did when my mom was diagnosed with dementia was to, I lived five minutes from my county's Department of Aging. And uh, the Senior Activity Center is in the same building. How convenient. I got to know those folks. I knew everybody's name. I knew what they did. I wanted to know everything. So that, that they were my first advocates in truth. And so, but you want to get to know these people, especially if you're in a situation where the person that you're caring for, you know, is brand new to this issue or disease or, or whatever. So you want to make, you know, friends early on. But if you're looking for um, a particular organization that can point you to um, a great advocate, the National Association of Senior Advocates, who knew there was such a thing? And they're really good at what they do too. They can point you in the right direction of, what type of advocate you need. And as you can see, they specialize in not only what the unique needs of older adults are, but finding the right person who can serve those needs. So I have uh, chatted with several of them over the last seven or eight years. I've never had to use them, but I, on several occasions, I've called for someone else help, helping to find uh, information and potential candidates for advocacy uh, for uh, folks in my one of the support groups I belong to and things like that. And let's not forget the Alzheimer's Association and AARP. Uh, if you have never been on the caregiving uh, section of AARP, please look at that. They have one of the best um, uh, sections for caregiving out there. Uh, one of my favorite things is their advocacy page. If you look at that, you can see the things that they're going to Capitol Hill to discuss. You can see any lawsuits they have, like uh, there was a, a recent lawsuit where they sued nursing homes for illegal evictions. You cannot uh, have a, a patient leave the nursing home and go to a hospital and then refuse to take them back. So AARP filed a suit on behalf of individuals who have had that occur to them. So a lot of advocacy out there that you don't even have to do yourself. So take a look at some of those pages and see if they have something that could help you with what you may need. So there's national advocacy, as I briefly mentioned. Here are just four um, examples. Uh, for Alzheimer's at the top, there's the National Ambassador Advocacy. That's where, if you've ever seen on Facebook or any other social media, where you see people with the purple sashes, those are the ambassadors. What do they do? They are empowered to go to Capitol Hill and interact with their you know, elected officials. You're trying to get them to vote for what you want or give more money for what you want. So two very powerful things. So all of a sudden you see, and I live, you know, 20 minutes from DC. I'm a fifth generation Washingtonian. So whenever you see all that purple in DC, it's all about the advocacy. So um, there's also the National Al Alzheimer's Project uh, Act and the uh, impact movement, they called it. And basically that's about their mission is to make sure you have all the support you need. It's about enhanced care. I love that term and being as supportive of caregivers as possible, Alzheimer's caregivers. But then when you're talking about just um, caregiving in general, the two most popular national advocacy pieces are the Family Caregiver Alliance. They've been around for 40 years. And again, their sole mission is to make sure that you as caregivers have all the tools that you need to be successful, whether it's money, uh, like a lot of people have had to quit their jobs. One of the reasons that the Family National Caregiver Act came about was because of advocacy like this, whereas people had to quit their job 
to take care of mom or dad or husband. And, you know, how are you going to replace that income? Part of the Family Caregiver Act, um, you know, allows for some funds to be paid if you are a full-time caregiver for your loved one. That all came about because of national advocacy. The National Alliance of uh, Caregiving, also known as NAC, they've been around since 1996. They too have a huge focus, but and they also add research to their um, piece of the pie in terms of advocacy. So if you are looking to do something on a national level, you wanna go to Capitol Hill, there I am, banging on my Congress people's doors, for more money for Alzheimer's. And I'm sure they look at us, uh, I, I do a lot of work with uh, us against Alzheimer's. And I'm sure every time we go to the hill, I'm sure they're thinking, here they come again. <laughs> and we will continue to come until they find a cure for uh, Alzheimer's. So keep looking for us because we're out there, but a lot of fabulous advocacy going on. And even if you don't have time to do that, just know that there are people out there working on your behalf and trying to get the best for you as you serve either as uh, paid caregivers or as family caregivers. So national advocacy is happening. So I put together some top tips that I hope are gonna help you um, do, fulfill this role if you have that um, need or, or that task in front of you. First and foremost, you wanna include the person that you're advocating for in the process as much as possible. That may be possible for many of you, as you know, in my case, um, it is not possible. My mother cannot say, what she wants or, or things like that. But thankfully, we have had those discussions in the past. So I'm not, you know, blind to it or anything. But if you're just starting out and a person is, you know, in the later stages of Alzheimer's, like my mom, and they can't tell you, you know, what you need to know, the second bullet there says, you know, think about some of their long held beliefs. If you've been a lifelong friend, like my mother's best friend, Mrs. Adams, they have been friends since kindergarten. Miss Adams could tell you everything my mother believes that the last thing my mother would want in this life is to be on the ventilator. So if I was out of town pre-COVID, I traveled all the time. I'd be in Illinois with you today if it were not for COVID. But if I was out of town, Miss Adams would speak up for my mom when she could not speak for herself. So if they know anything about you, um, you can know that you are speaking with what they would want, which is the third bullet there. And, you know, you have to make a lot of tough decisions at times as an advocate, and you have to be very forceful at times as an advocate. But when you know you are reflecting what that person wants, that's half the battle right there. And I think that's really, really um, important. That last bullet, it says, put your own beliefs aside when advocating for someone else. I hear a lot of in, in the support group that I help moderate, People say, I think Betsy should do so-and-so. Can I just say, not about you. So, you know, that's something we have to remember. This is about them. You have agreed to advocate for them, not to push whatever it is you would like to see Betsy do. So let's try to remember that that is a struggle for some people. I'm going to just be honest. A lot of some of the advocates that I know uh, make it a lot more about them. So we have to keep that reminder out there. We have to, you know, we may believe something totally different. We may want the ventilator and all these other things. And, but we have to remember, it is really not about us. And when we take this on, we have to remember what we signed up for. And um, one of the, I think, re most rewarding things about being an advocate is being well-versed in what you're advocating for. So I learned probably 10 things about Parkinson's that I did not know in the presentation before this one. So once you agree to do this, become as knowledgeable as you can about whatever the illness or issue is, because you get the best results then from what you're gonna be speaking about. You know, uh, if you don't know what a PET scan is, for example, and that's one of the things they do for Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or cancer or whatever it is, then you wanna know, hey, do I need to ask about this test? So try to get not only uh, familiar with the illness itself, but some of the treatments uh, like we, we heard earlier and, and be aware for some of the uh, symptoms that you may experience as well. Again, there's the privacy issue. Make sure that you're only talking to either family members or the medical team when you are um, advocating. And that again is, is really, really uh, important and it really does bear uh, repeating. Um, I love the last bullet 
and I am so much better at that now than I was 14 years ago when I started this journey with my mom. What that means when it says plan advocacy, advocacy actions you want to take, what does that mean? It means know what's coming. So I had never thought about the fact uh, that my mother was going to eventually start, you know, falling out of the bed and I needed to be looking at hospital beds and things like that. Uh, she's in, been in a wheelchair for the last month or so. It's temporary. I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. Um, but, but wow, the good thing they had a wheelchair at the group home where she lived. So make some notes about, are you going to need a hospital bed in the next year or so or the next six months? So start to look at some of the things you're going to need to ask about. Do you need assistance from Medicare or Medicare? Write all the things out that are going to help you get whatever the person you're advocating for needs. And when you when it says record, uh, keep track of, of your progress, that means if you talk to somebody at a medical supply company about getting said wheelchair or walker or hospital bay, whatever it is, get the name, get the name of the people, and get the price, get several prices. And so, you know, so the more things you have written down, the more plans you have, the, the better advocate you will be. That little um, list of resources on the right, again, feel free to take pictures of that. Um, it just has the uh, contact information for a lot of the most uh, popular national advocacy organizations. So I've talked to quite a uh, few of these uh, and they've been incredibly helpful. The Justice in Aging, wow, that's very close to uh, where I work. They do a lot in terms of uh, preventing elder abuse and that kind of thing. So uh, very excellent, uh, outstanding organizations for advocacy. So let's talk about some very specific things. Now, uh, one of the most interesting things, <laughs> I had sent this presentation in, in advance, just in case we had some technical difficulties and uh, they would have the slides. However, the slide you're looking at right now is a little different than what I sent in because this was today. That's how much I love you all. This is today. Uh, as you can see, you can kind of see my mom's in a sling. Mm -hmm. She had a fall, broke her left clavicle and not one, not two, but four ribs. Oh my. Uh, a couple of trips to the hospital for that one. She was in the hospital for four days uh, for that. She started having seizures and it made her really weak. And so the falls were a result of the weakness she, after uh, the seizure. She had never had seizures before July 2nd. So this has been quite the last six weeks for me. So there we are this morning. It says I'm smiling on my mask. You see that? And she was smiling too. She's pretty happy for somebody got four broken ribs. But in any case, she's healing quite well. But what you're looking at is sort of what I went through over this last week, preparing for this visit. Don't just show up. If you're somebody's advocate, be ready. So schedule the appointment. Um, this appointment was at 9.30 this morning, not only because I knew I had to speak this afternoon, but uh, afternoon, one of the speakers uh, early this afternoon spoke about sundowning. Sundowning, you do not want to have an Alzheimer's person out in public when sundowner shows up. So I always try to get my mom appointments in the morning. So that's what scheduled appointment wisely. What's best for your person? If they're not a morning person, okay, how about after lunch? So just consider those things. The second bullet says, be prepared for the visit. Wow, this I had not anticipated. Last week, I, last Monday, I started trying to get a ride for my mother. My mother has been in fabulous help. No cane, no walker, no nothing. So this broken rib thing has thrown us for a loop. You cannot just, uh, here in the DC area, we have something called Metro Access, which rides you everywhere in your wheelchair but it takes six months to get into the program. This is an emergency situation, so I need a ride. Guess how much it costs now in COVID era to transport somebody? $400. Are you kidding me? To go 18 miles. Who are you kidding? The group home where my mom lives, you're looking at them putting mom in the activity bus. woo for the activity bus. That's how I got mama to the hospital today for her doctor. And you couldn't see a doctor around here. I had to go all the way to the hospital where she was seen in DC because that's where she had the trauma visit. They transferred her, her ribs were so bad, they transferred her from the hospital down the street from my house to DC where they have trauma uh, surgeons for that. Thankfully she did not need surgery. But 
if I had not started in advance and, and saw how much it was going to cost and some people aren't doing travel at all right now, holy cow, what a nightmare this that was. But make sure you have everything, all your insurance cards. I have everything about my mother on my phone, in PDF form. I have her DNR. When she had the second seizure, it was so bad, they asked me to bring the DNR into the hospital. And uh, I did not think my mother would survive July, but you can see she's happy as a clam in that picture. But in the time when I was traveling, if something happened to my mother, I could email you or text you anything you needed to know about my mother. I even have some x-rays on my phone. So make sure you have things at hand that you can grab real quick and run off with and make copies of all referrals that you get as well. And while you're doing these sort of, whether it's a routine medical visit or a follow-up like what I did today with mom, make sure you write your questions down in advance and take notes. I just had a sort of referee a kind of altercation between two siblings last week because one lives out of town. The mother had a medical issue. The sister who lives out of town asked the sister who was the advocate to ask the doctor a particular question. Well, the sister didn't write it down and she forgot. And then they had this big you know, issue about it. So make sure you write your things down so you're very well prepared. And if you're representing the family, that you have taken into consideration all the questions that the family members want answered as well. And I think that's pretty key. Now, this is a pet peeve for me. <laughs> if you've known me a while, I'm, yep, doctors matter. And my mother matters too. So first impressions count. I cried and cried and cried. I'm not going to lie to you. The picture at the top, whew, I was in love with this doctor. She was the best doctor on earth. And then all of a sudden, she decides she's going to leave D.C. and go to Denver to marry somebody. I tried to pay somebody in D.C. to marry her, but it didn't quite work out. I was, I was hysterical that this woman was going to leave. She treated my mom like a real person. Just because they have Alzheimer's doesn't mean that you can dismiss them like they're not sitting right there. I'm all about the, you know, you will respect my mother regardless. And so, hmm, I, you know, make sure you... Have, you know, are comfortable with your first impression when you are picking, especially new doctors. And in COVID time, a lot of doctors are moving around. I've gotten three notices. My mom's neurologist. It said retired. He was like 30 years old. What was he retiring to? In any case, a um, lot of movement around uh, with this COVID thing. So your doctor who might be your doctor that you love might not be your doctor when COVID is over. So, you know, don't be afraid to pick the next one. Check out that bedside manner get a sense because even though my mother can't tell you how she's feeling whatever it took us three days to figure out she had broken ribs because she wasn't acting like she had broken ribs until she all of a sudden couldn't breathe one day three days after she broke her ribs in any case but get it she can still look at you a certain way or smile or nod or just kind of snuggle up to you even though she's not saying a word so i pay close attention to my mother's body language because she still gets a sense of you. So try to pick that up as well. And so again, make sure, especially if you're if the person you're advocating for can talk and, and has all their faculties, then make sure you take into account what they want too. Because the goal here is what's best for them and not so much us. Look at that last one. I have fired many, not many, several doctors. And when they don't have your best interests at heart, you don't have to stay with them. So after the, 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 the my first doctor, Dr. Curver at the top, when she retired, I thought there was never again going to be a person for us. Dr. Adoko at the bottom, whoo, best thing ever. And she is fab. She was so concerned about my mom's ribs. She has, you know, emailed me from the patient portal almost every day to get the, you know, everyday update on my mom because we really did think she was leaving here over this one. And she has just been fabulous. But the first time I met my mother's neurologist before, you know, the first time I ever went to an appointment with her, when she first started talking about mild cognitive impairment, I'm like, mm-hmm, time for me to go. Uh, he wanted her to take this medicine, Aricep, that she did not want to take. And when she said she didn't want to take it, which is her right, remember, patient's rights, it is her right to refuse, he made this comment. That's what's wrong with you people you people, meaning African-Americans, all you do is complain. My mother is the least complaining person on this earth. Remember, she lived three days with broken ribs and didn't say a word. 
So yeah, we got our things and left. I was very respectful. I was assertive, that kind of thing. And we left. That is not the doctor that I want taking care of my mother. So don't be afraid to fire people. This is your person that you're advocating for. You have every right to get a doctor that is going to treat you the way you deserve to be treated. So I can fire you in a minute because that's, um, you know, my mother's best interest is what's important. Now, ooh, I hadn't th thought about uh, COVID when I put this slide together, but look at all the other emergencies that come up. Wow. Amazing. So my suggestion, one of the best things I did for myself and my mom was to have an emergency checklist. And you have to keep that updated. It says, be ready in terms of disaster. You know, we've already had how many hurricanes? You know, one's out there floating around about to be a hurricane, I guess. And then we had, I say is, yes, or however you say that, a couple of weeks ago, or last week, I guess. Um, get those disaster checklists ready. When they say you have to evacuate, are you running around? And look at, what was it, yesterday? Y'all had a derecho in, in Illinois. How would I know that? But I was on a board advisory call when one of the women had to run to the basement and left the call. So derechos can, you know, take you out, 100 mile an hour wind. You don't have time to be running to 12 rooms to get something. Have your emergency bag and your emergency checklist for the person that you're advocating for if they live with you or make sure whoever they're with, if they live in the same city and are under the same emergency situation, make sure you all have everything written down. When my mother had her first seizure on July 2nd, she had two more. Um, June, uh, June 20th was the first one. July 2nd was the one to put her in the hospital. And then July 24th. And she was given anti-seizure medication. I added it to our emergency checklist. And when she had the third seizure, they upped the dose. I had to go back in and change it. Why is that important? It's important so that you can take the right steps at the right time. So, you know, we don't want to, you know, not be ready if she has an unexpected trip to the hospital, like what happened in our case. On she spent the like, July 4th weekend in the hospital for four days after the second seizure, which was a really bad one. And then for the broken ribs, she was in the hospital for four days as well. And so, you know, I have everything, as I said, situated and I can just run to the hospital and, and do whatever needs to be done. During this time, this is very stressful. So you want to stay calm and positive. I mean, I marched to the hospital with the DNR as they asked and, you know, handed it to them. They didn't let me stay more than 30 seconds. They would not let me see her, which I understood. In Maryland, they, when the cases started to go down, they uh, kept the visits uh, at a minimum. And so to keep the co co uh, I guess all of the different counts down. And so that was what was important. So emergencies are really important. What you're looking at on the right, the picture of her, that's my gratitude journal. And I was writing about how relieved I was that she was back. And, you know, we have to just be ready for all the things that are unexpected. So one of the most important roles you'll feel as an advocate is when emergencies come up. And that is true. So hospital admissions, I've talked to you about the two uh, ones in the last six weeks. What a, what a July and August this has been for me so far. But make sure you talk with all the physicians. In both cases, I was not allowed to see my mom, but I got every nurse's name I talked to, every doctor's name. What was funny was that somebody recognized my mother. We had been in the Post. We'd been in the New York Times. Somebody had recognized my mom and said, I think there's a book about her. <laughs> <laughs> and so I told them, you better take care of my mom or I write about you. Really funny. We had the best time. I got to know all of them over the four and a half days she was there. I'm sure I got on their nerves by calling, but this is, you know, you know, we had already been separated for 90 days, you know, with no visiting at the group home. And I wanted to make sure she was well taken care of. All of those bullets there, you can read those. But again, just make sure her wishes are respected. They're asking for the DNR because, you know, you know, with COVID, a lot of people end up on, you know, the ventilators. And they want to make sure not only her uh, DNR, but that most the document that they were talking about earlier today, which talks about all the that kind of care. So we have to make sure when they're a hospital admission, you get the name of all the people. You understand clearly what the follow up care is going to be. So I knew that today I didn't know what day, but I knew in two weeks from her hospital discharge, I was going to have to get her all the way down to the Washington Hospital Center and get uh, new x-rays so they could determine. They took the sling off. That's how much she's healed. She's 91 years old. Mm. And they just took the sling right off. Like she don't need that anymore. She was as happy as she could be without the little sling. 
So now she can go back to the um, physical therapy she was taking to sort of get the strength back in her legs uh, from the seizure, uh, whatever long lasting effect that was from the seizure. We still don't know why, but she doesn't have any um, strength in her legs at all, which uh, of course caused the fall. So now with the um, physical therapy, she should be able to end this wheelchair thing uh, for good. So these hospital admissions are so important of what's going to happen next long term in terms of treatment. And so you want to be well on top of that. This is just, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I want to just make sure we're clear on communication, you know, referring to people by their name, especially if somebody's with dementia and they still are fairly with it, talking to them only about one thing at a time. Um, don't have loud music or anything playing, make sure they uh, get a clear understanding of what you're saying and uh, be calm when you're doing it. So communication is so important, not only with the doctors and the medical team, but also with the person that you're advocating for, especially if they can still speak for themselves. Now, this is my case. How do you do best practices when someone doesn't live with you? Well, this is, these are my mother's rights for the group home that she lives in. They love this woman as much as I do, so I don't have any issue with them. That's Janet on the right in the blue and uh, Shelly on the left. And they absolutely love this woman. But if there are issues, make sure you voice your complaints. And, and I tell you, that dignity and respect, that's all. I'm all about that. I already told you I fired a doctor over it. And so make sure everything is on above board with that. Um, they don't even allow many personal possessions. You can't have money in the group home. I mean, whenever there's the podiatrist or somebody comes, when there's a copay, I go over with the money. Uh, we don't even have a safe or lock anything that you wouldn't want anybody else to take. So, and they certainly have a right to go from one facility to transfer it in another if they don't like it for whatever reason. That is the patient's right. So that is really important. Now, uh, <laughs> my number one, uh, the first bullet says, <laughs> be wary of facilities that require calling before visiting. I'm gonna let that sink in for a second. To me, that's code for, uh, tell us you're coming, then we can get them all cleaned up and ready and looking good before you show up. Mm -mm. I'm gonna come whenever I feel like coming, for lack of a better way to say that. So yeah, that's always a bad sign when somebody says that. And then make sure I looked at all of the reports of, um, you know, the operation facility, the woman that owns the, the group home, she owns five of them. This woman's record is, I mean, spotless. And um, she has a, an amazing network in the county where we live. And so I've seen all records of accidents and things. Somebody that opens their books to you to show what kind of operation they wanted, that's what you want to have. And then I did this for sure, especially when I was choosing the group home I was going to put her in. Uh, this was my mother's wish not to live with her kids. So uh, that's why she's in a group home. That was her choice. And I'm living into that for her. And so, but I went to every shift. I went in the morning. I worked 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. So I would go at four in the morning sometime when I get up and do my workout. And uh, they were always above board. They were awake and alert and all that. Janet, when she got out of the hospital, she was up with my mom, you know, in the middle of the night to make sure she was breathing okay, that the lungs weren't bothering her. That's the kind of place that you want. So a lot of advocacy need when the person does not live uh, with you. Loretta, we have about five minutes. I just, okay. uh, just give you that. And I just, somebody did say, do you have a sample emergency checklist you can share with us? I will, I will try to send you one. Yep. I will see if I can pull that out. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, if things go wrong, you want to definitely choose your battles. Don't overreact. Make sure you write everything down. Um, you know, some things have gone wrong. You see that big knot in, under my mom's chin. That was when she fell and broke her little clavicle. They took three days for that to pop up. That's when you know something's broken. If you can have elder abuse issues, make sure you call somebody because that's always um, a big thing. I was talking to Jennifer Prell a few days ago about an ombudsman. If you don't know that term, they are folks who are responsible for getting help and assistance for somebody that's not being treated well in a nursing home. If you've spoken to management about the same issue 20 times and nothing has happened, you can go to an om ombudsman. We had a big situation with my aunt's roommate when my aunt was in a nursing home. The lady fell out of the bed. The, they just picked her up and put her back in. She was moaning, they didn't do anything. My cousin and I had to threaten them. If you don't call the ambulance for her, it was days later, 
we're going to call the state. And they did. And of course, she was, you know, had a broken hip and she died. And so, of course, her children, who never visited, by the way, uh, sued them for lots of money. But and the next, it upset us so much. My cousin uh, took training to become an ombudsman the very next week. That's how devastated we were by my aunt's roommate's death because it was so unnecessary if they had called the ambulance right away. But when people don't vent us, they just throw you in the bed and say, okay, you, you don't need anything. And that's very unfair. Elder abuse, I showed you that advocacy part about uh, the lawyers that are you know, seeking elder care attorney. One of the women in the um, uh, a support group I, I'm in on Facebook, I'm gonna give this woman a lot of credit. She got to her wits end with her dad who had abused her as a child and couldn't take care of him anymore, she called the police on herself and said, please come get him. And they did. And I applaud her for knowing that she had reached her wits in and um, they took him right on the way to somewhere else. And I applaud her for not hitting him, knocking him down. What, what, that's what she called 911 to say, I'm about to hurt him, please come get him. And they did. And I really give her so much credit for that. But what you're looking at on the slide is all the information that you would need if you uh, think that all uh, elder abuse is an issue. But please make sure you say something as an advocate um, for doing that. I don't need to say a lot about hospice because Katie talked about that quite a bit this afternoon. I learned a lot from that. But I, I will say one thing. That picture is my sister and my niece and my sister's birth last birthday. Uh, she died at 61 from MS. I had to fly from DC to LA where she was. I was taking care of both of them, my mother and my sister, but I couldn't take care of them both. I sent her to live with my niece. When, when she got to her final stage and she was in so much pain, my niece didn't want to call in hospice because she thought then you die the next day. So I had to fly out there to kind of talk my niece into doing hospice so my sister would not be in a lot of pain. And it was just like Katie described, it was wonderful. She saved us, they saved us. And it was my third experience with hospice. We went to both my aunts and my grandmother. And so it was just a natural choice for my sister. And it was the most fabulous you know, thing. And the support of the family, which it says on that third bullet there, um, the emotional support, I think, is what we needed more than anything. And so they are great at that. It's not just about the drugs and they give you morphine and you die and all that. You know, it's just relieving the person of pain. And my niece was so glad we had called them in. I thought it was going to be a big issue, but I just didn't want my sister to be in pain. And my sister was in horrific pain those last um, few weeks. And so we got a limit to, you know, all of that. And that was so important for me, but they can be life-changing for some families and make it a very positive experience, even if the person dies. There's a way to die too. And, and I just applaud them and what they do and you know, just say it's not for everybody. So to be the best advocate you can be, you want to speak up, you want to be honest, and you want to be vigilant. And that is um, you know, some of the best advice I could be. Uh, I've had, you know, quite a bit of sex success. AARP <laughs> calls me the entertainment director. They said, you, you know, you have a lot of fun with your mom, you do a lot of activities, but you don't play either. So don't mess with my mom. You know, we are going to give my mom the best, you know, life she can have from this point. She hasn't known me for six years. That does not matter. She calls me very nice person. I'm happy to be that. And everybody knows I'm her kid. And so we're going to do what my mother wants. I want her to be safe and I want her to be happy. And she's happy every day now because, you know, she doesn't know any better. And that's what I want. That's all I want for her. And I'm going to do talk to any doctor or get any service for her that I need to get because she's important. And so hopefully I've given you a few things that can help you with advocacy. And I thank you all for joining us this afternoon. So wonderful and so many lovely comments. You seem to be a top-notch advocate. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone can speak like that. Glad you fired that doctor. <laughs> Oh, oh man, practices. and that's how this article starts off. We were in psychology today a few weeks ago. It was You're like, oh, right. treating the patient with respect is so important, especially for individuals with dementia. I am shocked. I would have been so angry with that doctor. Man, <laughs> so you, got a really like, nice you had to let that sink in. Like, wow, did he really just yeah. say that? Yeah, yeah. he absolutely, and he was serious too. Wow. Well, like thank him? you so yeah. much, Loretta, for this you are so really well. informative piece and. Um, uh, we're really grateful to you, and and thanks everybody for attending. It's just wonderful. I hope you all are. There any questions in there? Yeah. Other questions? I think we're good. Okay. Yay. Um, Loretta, the only question I have. This is Jennifer. Yes, ma'am. 
is how you didn't punch the doctor in the face. <laughs> you know, I, I would not have put up with that. You know, I, and I had to go past him to give, I, you know, it was wintertime. I got our purses and our coats. I, I just kind of slinked by him to not, I, I could have, you know, hit him with my mom's purse in the head as we went by. But yeah, I, I it took me a while to kind of like, wow, he just said that. But uh, it's been, we've had a couple of little things like that. However, um, yeah, she taught me to be uh, in nice no matter what. So I did. And, you know, you don't want the word to get out either. A lot of these people know, you know, all these neurologists know each other. So I didn't want to put the word out that I'm a horrible person. So I... Um, You're definitely not a uh, horrible person, Loretta, for God's sake. So, yeah, I just moved on and uh, found somebody wow. 20 times better. So, yeah. Oh, we do have someone who wants to be your friend now because you're oh, fun. Oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Loretta Woodward Vini on Facebook. There you go. And well, my, you know, my phone number's in there, so. Yeah, and if you lived in Illinois, man, we would have so much fun. <laughs> yeah, she's an East Coaster, so. That's all right. I can, you know, uh, when COVID will eventually be over and I can travel again. So, but thank you all for having, this is the first time I've actually done like 45 minutes on, on this. So yeah, this will be my, my new favorite topic. So this is cool. Your new favorite topic. Yeah. You're a very good advocate for your mother. Um, <laughs> the only thing I can say is I agree 100% that every person needs an advocate if mm -hmm. they're in any type of community, especially skilled nursing. Absolutely. And if they don't have an advocate or you don't have time, you need to hire one. And they're, they're and it's not uh, very expensive at all. I pointed uh, some of the folks in my, um, the Facebook support group, Us Against Alzheimer's, and um, several of them have hired uh, advocates and they're very reasonable, depends on how many times you meet or what you need them to do, but it's very worth your time, especially if you know you are not a, a, an especially assertive person and um, that you're not sure you can speak up for whatever they need. So yeah, I think that's key in whatever, um, you know, we need to get for them. I think that's so, it's so important. And ElderWorks can refer our local advocates in Illinois and Southern Wisconsin, so that's fine. We can't do Maryland, we'll send you Loretta. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of them now, so yeah, that's awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thank You're you. Welcome.